I have decided to produce a couple of videos explaining a couple of the more common and more overused logical fallacies, exactly what they are, why you should avoid using them, and giving some examples of arguments that are in common circulation as mantras by various movements that blatantly use these logical fallacies without shame. I decided I would start by explaining the red herring fallacy. The red herring fallacy is the fallacy committed when you arbitrarily change the subject, especially if you do so because you know that the current topic of argumentation is one that you cannot possibly win. It's called the red herring fallacy because of an old method that was used to train dogs in which a bunch of smelly and, unlike in this picture, dead red herrings were dragged across a scent trail and the owner would attempt to get the dog to follow the scent trail rather than the red herrings, which would be much more attractive to the dog. It's difficult to come up with a mantra that does a very good job of representing this fallacy because it's difficult to cram into a mantra. It's a debate tactic that's used live rather than an actual problem with the argument. It could be that you segue with your red herring into an argument that is completely valid, it's just completely irrelevant. The best example I can think of, though, is Jason Lyle's argument that uh, those who are against creationism have no right to complain about the distant starlight problem until we solve the horizon problem. In reality, the fact that we don't have an answer for the horizon problem, and I haven't bothered to look up whether we do or not, uh, is completely irrelevant to whether or not they have an adequate answer to the distant starlight problem. Now, of course, the reason that Jason Lyle has to drag some red herring across the trail leading to the resolution of the distant starlight problem is because the only possible solution is that the Earth isn't actually 6,000 years old. But of course, he can never accept that because creationists are forbidden to admit that they're wrong about anything save for matters of semantics and statistics. I'm also going to explain the genetic fallacy because this is a pilot episode. In future episodes, I will explain only one logical fallacy per episode. The genetic fallacy is the fallacy committed when somebody assumes that because an argument started as invalid or comes from a questionable origin, it is therefore an invalid argument or a false statement. A couple of examples. The argument that the New Testament cannot be the inspired word of God because parts of it were voted on by committee in something around 300 AD-ish, I believe. The fact that the Council of Nicaea voted on which books would be in the New Testament and not does not have anything to do with whether or not the books selected are divinely inspired and has nothing to do with the truth value of the statements made in the books themselves. Another example is the Southern Baptist Convention. The Southern Baptist denomination of Christianity, which I just so happen to belong to, is far more benevolent in its activities than are the normal Baptists considered to be today. They're actually so different that they're literally infamous for opposite things. The Southern Baptists are infamous for their emphasis on the love of Christ. The Baptists are infamous for their emphasis on damnation, though doctrinal differences are few and far between between the two groups. Considering that Southern Baptism is a far more benevolent form of Christianity, it might interest you to know that the initial split between them occurred when a group of people who would later become the Southern Baptists, or better put, the ancestors of the Southern Baptists, supported slavery and attempted to use the Bible to justify it, whereas the people who were the normal Baptists did no such thing. That doctrinal difference has since eroded, and now all of the differences are in approach. It doesn't matter what historically the Southern Baptist Church was. It really doesn't matter what the Southern Baptist Church initially believed at its split. What matters is the beliefs and practices 
that it has now. 